nuestro saludo respetuoso a la representación de la sociedad civil, los peticionarios, las distintas, las distintas organizaciones, a la representación de, y me gusta verlo, de la mujer indígena en presencia. Muchas gracias por estar acá con nosotros a la distinguida representación de el Estado, de la Uni del Estado de Estados Unidos de América. Eh, quisiera eh, dar inicio a esta audiencia haciendo un especial reconocimiento al Estado de Jamaica por permitirnos poder celebrar nuestro 172 periodo de sesiones en, este, en esta bella tierra. Estamos muy complacidos porque representa para la Comisión esta oportunidad de hacer eh, cumplimiento de parte de nuestro programa de plan estratégico de acercarnos a los países del Caribe. Eh, también nuestro saludo a la audiencia que nos sigue a través de los medios eh, electrónicos y quienes nos acompañan en, en presencialmente. Eh, esta audiencia eh, tiene eh, una temática eh, muy importante para la Comisión porque representa precisamente... El, el trabajo en particular de la fuerza de los defensores de derechos humanos y en este caso defensores de eh, derechos humanos eh, por parte de eh, la, la población indígena. Entonces vamos a distribuir el tiempo con 15 minutos para cada una de las partes, comentarios de eh, los colegas. Quiero también expresar mi eh, eh, complacencia de poder contar en esta audiencia con la participación de la segunda vicepresidenta de la Comisión, Antonia Urrejola, la comisionada Margaret May Macaulay, el comisionado Francisco Eguiguren, el relator para la libertad de expresión, Edison Lanza, nuestro secretario ejecutivo y nuestra uh, jefa de gabinete, Marisol Blanchard. Eh, muchísimas gracias. Vamos entonces a, a, a otorgarle inmediatamente la palabra a la sociedad civil, a las representaciones. Les voy a pedir que por favor eh, se eh, identifiquen para el correspondiente registro. Good morning, distinguished members of the Commission, Secretariat, and representatives of the United States government. My name is Shauna Howard. I'm with the University of Arizona Indigenous Peoples Law and Policy Program. Thank you for meeting with us today. We requested this hearing along with the Water Protectors Legal Collective and over 70 Indigenous and environmental organizations. The Water Protector Legal Collective has provided legal defense to the indigenous-led resistance to the Dakota Access Pipeline at the Standing Rock Sioux Reservation in North Dakota. I am here today supporting this delegation of indigenous women who are at the forefront of resistance to pipelines, energy projects, and militarization of indigenous lands. They have traveled here to share their personal stories and are urgently seeking help from the international community as we all face the imminent threat of climate change caused by the fossil fuel industry. Standing Rock is an emblematic case of indigenous resistance to extractive industry that drew attention from around the world as water protectors met on the banks of the Missouri River 
in peaceful assembly and in what was the largest gathering of indigenous peoples in the United States in 100 years. Standing Rock is merely one example of how the United States government works with industry to approve energy projects carried out without the meaningful participation or consent of indigenous nations. Indigenous peoples are left with no choice but to peacefully protest and then are criminalized for their efforts to defend their lands and resources. Since Standing Rock, there has been an increasing trend by state legislatures to criminalize indigenous peoples and their allies who voice opposition to pipelines and other so-called critical infrastructure projects. The information provided today builds on a 2016 request for precautionary measures filed by the Standing Rock, Cheyenne River, and Yankton Sioux tribes and past commission reports on indigenous peoples and extractive activities and the criminalization of human rights defenders. In addition, the United Nations has reported on the situation at Standing Rock through the Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, the Expert Mechanism, and the Permanent Forum. We encourage the United States to comply with its obligations under the U.S. Constitution, the American declarations on both the rights and duties of man and the rights of indigenous peoples, specifically the rights of all citizens to free expression, peaceful assembly, judicial protection, and equality before the law, and the rights of indigenous peoples to self-determination and rights to culture, religion, and property including rights and interest in traditional territories and sacred areas designated at, as public lands. We call upon the Commission to follow up on the requests to the United States issued by the UN Special Rapporteur to develop and provide anti-oppression and anti-racism training to law enforcement agents and to mandate the Department of Justice to open an investigation into the excessive use of force and militarized response to the water protectors at Standing Rock. We also have a, a, a number of other recommendations that we will share with the commission in a follow-up written report. Thank you. Um, I'm from the Thonautam, the desert people of the Southwest Turtle Island, now called Arizona, United States, and Chuigu, Sonora, Mexico. I am Ophelia Rivas. I acknowledge this um, island's ancestors, the Arawak, Arawak people. Today I'm testifying as a direct witness of the and a descendant of over 500 years of brutal ge genocidal policies against indigenous people by the United States government. In 1848, the U Treaty of Guadalupe, Hidalgo, and in 1853, the Gadsden Purchase divided my original homelands into two countries, the United States and Mexico, without dis any discussion and agreement with the Tohono O'odham. Today, we exist on one-tenth of our original lands in the United States, and our homelands in Mexico have been stolen and sold by the and sold by the state government and have been taken over by drug cartels, displacing and forcing people into exile. With uh, the most recent impact after 9-11 was the heavily militar militarization of our homelands by the United States uh, Department of Homeland Security. The racist U.S. policies <coughs> Uh, such as the Patriot Act and Im inhumane immigration policies greatly affect the Thon Autumn, each Thon Autumn household. Today, people are attacked with dogs. They have been invaded, have home invasions. They're detained uh, in their homes, within their homes, with their children. People are attacked on the roads by armed military, often forced off the road and detained and without cause. The United States Department of Homeland Security criminalized the Tohono O'odham. I have witnessed elders, 80 years old, forced to kneel with their arms be behind their heads on the roadside for not speaking English or Spanish because they only speak their own language and do not understand the demands to provide citizenship, uh, proof of citizenship on their own homelands. The United States uh, Manifest Destiny legacy of genocidal policies of superiority and destined to subjugate and outright wipe out the so-called inferior races prevails as the world witnessed the attack on water protectors at Standing Rock. Thank you for listening 
at this time, and it has been difficult to reduce the statement with time allowed. I pray that all impacted animals and plants and living beings will be fully recognized and protected. Thank you. Thatia, Nishishishuzi, Punk Abadi, my state punk, Oklahoma. Wahi Tamashik Teratinike, Ganka D. Tate Ati. Good morning to you. I'm Judy. My colonized name is Casey Camp Hornick. I'm from the occupied territory of Oklahoma or Indian Territory. I want to say thank you for listening to the honored commissioners. Also want to say thank you to the ancestors of the Arawak people and to the people of Jamaica. I'm a member of the Ponca Nation of Oklahoma. I serve as an elected council member. I'm also the hereditary drum keeper for the Women's Society. The Ponca had their traditional land stolen by the federal government under the Treaty of 1868. And at that time, we were forcibly removed to Oklahoma, which was Indian Territory at that time. There were three indigenous tribes there. Now there are 39 federally recognized tribes. My tribe was one of those that walked a trail of tears. My grandfather was eight years old at that time when he walked 670 miles with my grandparents and great-grandparents. One in three died on that trip. Another one in three died after our forced removal down there. We, forced, we were from the Missouri River where the Niabrara and Nishu Day, or the Missouri River, came together. We now live in an area that is entirely impacted by the extractive industry, particularly at this time, Phillips 66 refinery and tank batteries were impacted by fracking. All of the water is being poisoned. All of the water is being extracted as well. We had 10,000 earthquakes in the last five years that are man-made earthquakes that are impacting our water sources. All of the four legs, fins, wings, under the grounds, all of those things are being impacted. You can't grow organic food within an eight mile radius of where we live because of the extractive industry polluting us so bad. Virtually every single family has many, many cancel, cancer problems, autoimmune problems, children being born with cancer, many children not making it to birth. So we live under a policy of environmental genocide with the policies of the United States government continuing to deregulate and allow more pollution to happen, including carbon trading, which is poisoning the air even more. And commodifying all of the sacred to us is, is a crime. We have passed a, our own statute called the Rights of Nature that we believe will give us some uh, stature in the courts and we will be taking people into the Ponca courts. When Standing Rock happened, my sons were up there. We were there as a result of prayer. When my sons called me and told me about a meeting of the, uh, the tribal historic preservation officers, I went up there. And that was on October 22nd, 27th of 2016. When I arrived at this meeting, it was to protect all the things downstream where my people's traditional lands and graveyards were. All of the tribes that were gathered there heard about a heavy militarized police force that was uh, descending on the treaty camp that was just north of, of the original camp. And it was there to protect the Missouri River at that time, to keep the pipeline from going through that had not been allowed through a white area just north of that, but was being allowed. Standing Rock were our allies. We gave them our, our uh, allyship in form of resolution. When we arrived there, and the police began to come. There were helicopters, planes, drones, armed personnel vehicles with uh, LRAD, sound cannons, percussion grenades, pepper spray, hundreds of militarized, riot-geared police who descended on us and began to brutalize us. 
knocking us to the ground as we stood in prayer, hundreds of unarmed women, men, and children. They zip-tied us. They put us on the ground. They hauled us in buses to the basement of Morton County Jail, where they imprisoned us in dog cages after they wrote numbers on our arms, like the Jews going to the gas chambers. That was my number, number 138. There was 142 of us arrested that day, children in there having seizures because they were untreated diabetics. We were kept in dog cages on the bare cement floor. This is only one sign of things that have happened to us. And since I came back, House Bill 1138 was passed in Oklahoma to further criminalize us. Thank you. Yat Ayabin, Leola Kaboyanisha, Dine Nishla. I am here today to serve as a voice for the no dapple political prisoners because they are imprisoned and I consider each family. I come in a good way, and I'm a, I am honored to be the wife of no dapple political prisoner Little Feather. These five indigenous people encountered the most serious charges. They are Red Fawn Fallis, Michael Little Feather Hudon, Dion Ortiz, Michael Radler Marcus, and James Angry Bird White. Each has endured federal indictments. The men were facing 15 years in prison and one woman, life. Each faced with no choice but to accept non-cooperating plea agreements, and as a result of the denial of discovery rights, denial of change of venue, despite surveys showing the local jury pool was substantially biased by the concerted corporate propaganda campaign. One person has received two years supervised release and another 16 months in prison. The remaining three are currently in federal prisons across the United States, far from their families and communities, currently serving 36 to 57 months. I have a statement, and I'll read it from Red Fawn. I was at the Ochetti Chicoan camp to defend the water, the land, and the treaties. I was also there to honor the memory and life work of my mother, Troy Lynn Star Yellow Wood, who passed to the spirit world. There, I found a place where I belonged. I worked with elders and youth. I was trained as a medic for the people. During my time there, I was arrested three times. The first was in August of 2016 along a public right away. There were a small group of us exercising our free speech rights against the Dakota Access Pipeline. Again, in September 2016, I was arrested along with 20 other people. We were praying and tying, tie, pray, excuse me, prayer ties to a fence, not crossing any fences. As we were leaving Morton County Sheriff's deputies began arresting us for praying peacefully on our treaty homelands. And then October 2016, I was tackled from behind and brutally arrested without probable cause of, and accused of having a gun. The only gun that was brought into camp was by Heath Harmon, an FBI informant. He started a dishonest relationship with me. We understand the importance of our reciprocal relationship with water and all the life it supports. Thank you. Water is life. Honorable Commissioners, hello. My name is Michelle Cook. I'm an enrolled member of the Navajo Nation, one of 500 indigenous people still living in the United States. The state party will tell you that the U.S. protects indigenous peoples. They will tell you they support the U.N. Declaration. They will talk to you about a consultation policy and compliance with human rights. What they won't tell you is how those rights are abrogated, extinguished, and divested for private profit for oil companies like ETP and TransCanada. I I am here to tell you the Indian side of what we learned during and after the phenomenon of Standing Rock and the Dakota Access Pipeline. In the case of the Dakota Access Pipeline, during the seven months from September 2016 to February 2017, at least 76 law enforcement agencies, 35 federal agencies, and private security firms hired by the oil company were present at some time. Over the seven months, law enforcement and prosecutors aggressively aggressively charged 841 water protectors exercising their constitutional rights and peaceful assembly. Many of these arrested were detained under abusive conditions, subjected to unnecessary strip searches, and jailed, hour and jailed hours away from camps in humiliating conditions. Local authorities prosecuted, against, prosecuted these criminal charges 
despite the fact that there was no probable cause to support a vast majority of the arrests and no evidence to prove the charges. Water Protector Legal Collective is currently pursuing a class action lawsuit regarding the injuries that occurred on November 20th. Post Standing Rock, oil and gas interests are pushing to criminalize protests against their fossil fuel projects by engineering bills purported to protect against critical infrastructure sabotage. To date, there are 95 anti-protest bills that have been proposed, 35 states including North Dakota, 14 have passed, 24 are pending, 55 have been expired and defeated, and 28 are currently pending in state legislators. In Texas, for example, House Bill 3557 would make some forms of protest a second-degree felony on par with second-degree murder. In South Dakota, riot boosting, um, riot boosting Act has created a fund specifically um, dedicated to going after groups out of the state. These bills are a direct response to Standing Rock, and we encourage the commission to look at these bills and to um, vamos, follow the recommendation vamos, of the special rapporteur. Thank you. Suspender para la, los minutos luego, después en la segunda vuelta. Tenemos dos minutos con 30 segundos más para la representación del de Estado. Le damos la palabra de inmediato. Thank you very much and good morning. I will quickly introduce ourselves before we uh, initiate. I'm, I'm Alexis Ludwig. I'm the deputy permanent representative uh, at the U United States Mission to the Organization of American States. I'm Thomas Wetherall, and I'm an attorney advisor with the Office of a Legal Advisor at the U.S. Department of State. Thank you, and good morning. Good morning. I'm Brian Bliss, and I work in the U.S. Embassy here in Kingston, Jamaica. So thank you. We'll, we'll, we will try to make a dual presentation and try to remain within the time limits if we can. But just want to say how uh, honored I am to be here uh, with you all. And the ambassador would have liked to be here, because, but because we're the chair of the Permanent Council in Washington, he was unable to, and I'm representing the mission on his behalf this morning. And you, you all know how much we value the work of the, of the commission. Uh, the United States is a strong supporter of the commission, probably the strongest supporter of the commission among the entire member state uh, of the organization. Uh, we value the work even if sometimes we do not acknowledge the competency of the Commission to look into certain matters that may be subject of pending um, judicial action in the United States. So th that, that duality sort of exists and I'm here not to dismiss the claims that we have just heard this morning. In fact, there, there, there's clearly an issue uh, to be resolved, a series of issues. Uh, we, ac we accept them, but we're here to give a little bit of context from the state's point of view about how these are playing out within, within our own system. But I would like to thank the, the civil society groups and the uh, tribal members for their presentations and uh, for their, your advocacy in, in promoting the rights of indigenous peoples. Uh, it's a very important. We may not always agree, but we do value the fact that you're doing this work. So th these issues are, of course, uh, the source of continued attention in our country. And I want to clarify uh, that in the presentations we just heard, there, there's discussions of a number of specific situations and, of course, a very general situation, a pervasive one that goes deep into the history of our country. But I also want to remind uh, the Commission of the scope of this hearing, which is a thematic hearing under Art Article 66 of the Commission's Rules of Procedure, and it's not a petition-based hearing about any particular case. Uh, as such, we're going to be discussing our policies more generally rather than getting any detailed matters, even though these will touch on some of the specific matters that have been raised. I'd also like to uh, emphasize that these issues are very, very complicated given the federal structure of the United States, uh, as well as the status of federally recognized tribes which are sovereign nations under the U.S. Constitution with their own governmental structures and a series of specific rights under the Constitution and federal law. The executive branch of the United States government has degrees of flexibility in the manner in which federal tribal policy is implemented as certain policies are governed by laws passed by our Congress. And I can assure the Commission that the United States government is committed 
to improving the lives of indigenous persons, both in the United States and in other countries, and ensuring that there, these communities prosper and are resilient. We continue to strengthen our government-to-government -government political relationship with US federally recognized tribes when formulating our broader policy objectives. A US federal executive order, uh, Executive Order 13175, promotes regular, meaningful consultations between the US government and US federally recognized tribes on policies affecting them. We're grateful for the work and persistence of the indigenous governments and peoples for all the important efforts to ensure that we are respecting and honoring the commitments outlined in the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. We continue to press for robust implementation of this important UN Declaration, including at the Organization of American States and among our member states. The federal government has taken a number of actions, both domestically and on the world stage, to promote and further the rights of indigenous peoples. On the global stage, we are proud of the role we've played in recent years in strengthening and improving UN bodies charged with promoting the rights of indigenous peoples. Last week, for example, we engaged at the United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. And I will, I will skip the details of the engagement, but the engagement is real and it's an integral part of our diplomatic work, both uh, at home and abroad. So while much of our focus on issues of importance to indigenous peoples has necessarily been at the United Nations, we recognize this commission can also play a role, as pointed out by our friends who have just spoken. The commission does not have a mandate under its governing instruments to interpret and apply human rights instruments or other instruments beyond the American Declaration of the Rights and Duties of Man, which, as you know, is not legally binding. As such, the Commission does not have the competence to interpret and apply the UN or American declarations on the rights of indigenous peoples, both of which are also non-binding. Nevertheless, the Commission contributes to a, contribute to a critically important voice in this dialogue that can go a long way in advancing the human rights of indigenous individuals in the Americas. In the United States, the federal government is also dedicated to advancing the rights of Native Americans and to improving their lives. During the past decade, the federal government has experienced a greatly improved relationship with most tribal governments, which has helped to further tribal self-determination and self-governance. So I'll turn the floor over to my colleague and we'll switch several times hereafter. Thank you, Alexis. So in March of 2017, the United States created an informal State Department-led interagency working group to discuss what can be done to reduce the violence against environmental defenders, including indigenous environmental defenders. The working group focuses on countries that have had reports of violence against environmental defenders reported by the United Nations and non-governmental organizations. It also focuses on identifying and seeking to expand best practices to protect environmental defenders, prevent attacks, intimidation, and criminalization of their roles, investigate attacks, and bring those responsible to justice. The working group has identified trends in publicly available reporting that indicate long-standing grievances, often pertaining to land use, can be at the root of social protest or action in which state-backed security forces have responded, sometimes with force. The working group seeks to evaluate and identify practices to better provide with partners strengthened and relevant stakeholder access to environmental information, robust environmental impact review of the extractive sector, energy and infrastructure tenders and projects, transparency, and access to justice in cases of violence. Um, turning to the Voluntary Principles on Security and Human Rights Initiative, the United States is a founding member of the Voluntary Principles, a multi-stakeholder initiative consisting of governments, civil society, and extractive companies, all of whom are committed to implementing or assisting in the implementation of the Voluntary Principles. The Voluntary Principles are a compilation of principles intended to guide companies in maintaining the safety and security of their operations within an operating framework that ensures respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms. The United States strongly encourages extractive companies to implement the voluntary principles. This would include ensuring that any private security companies hired have policies regarding appropriate conduct and the local use of force. 
As a general matter, the voluntary principles further note that private security should act in a lawful manner and exercise restraint and caution in a manner consistent with applicable international guidelines regarding the local use of force, as well as with emerging best practices developed by companies, civil society, and governments. On the topic of the treatment of indigenous human rights and environmental defenders of the Dakota Access Pipeline, the United States takes seriously reports alleging that excessive force may have been used by local or private or other non-federal officers against persons peacefully demonstrating against construction of the Dakota Access Pipeline in the state of North Dakota near Lake Hawaii and the Missouri River. Following the use of dogs by private security officers hired by the company that's constructing the Dakota Access Pipeline, the Morton County, North Dakota Sheriff's Office established a task force to investigate the incident. The task force consisted of representatives of the Morton County Sheriff's Office, the Mercer County Sheriff's Office, the North Dakota Bureau of Criminal Investigation, and the Federal Bureau of Indian Affairs within the United States Department of the Interior. The investigation determined that private security personnel were not licensed to do security work in the state of North Dakota. The findings from that investigation were forwarded to the Morton County State's Attorney's Office and the North Dakota Private Investigation and Security Board for review. The North Dakota Private Investigation and Security Board sued the North Carolina company that handled security for the developer of the Dakota Access Pipeline project. The board sought $2 million in fines from the company as well as an injunction prohibiting the company and its owner from operating in North Dakota without a license. The case is currently on appeal before the Supreme Court of the State of North Dakota where it is scheduled for oral argument next week. The U.S. Department of Justice also followed the situation closely and took appropriate action. Shortly after the protest began, staff from DOJ's Office of Community-Oriented Policing Services, the Office of Tribal Justice, and Community Relations Service were dispatched to the protest areas. They worked to promote dialogue between the tribal leaders and law enforcement officials to reduce tensions, promote public safety, and support conduct that is in conformity with the U.S. Constitution's First Amendment rights of free speech, assembly, and the free exercise of religion. DOJ's Civil Rights Division monitored the situation and established a dedicated telephone number and email address to receive complaints. DOI law enforcement officers from the Bureau of Indian Affairs were not directly engaged at the site of the protests because it was outside of their jurisdiction. In addition, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers was in continuous communication with the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe, Energy Transfer Partners, and Dakota Access LLC regarding site and weather conditions. On February 7, 2017, the Corps granted Dakota Access LLC an easement for the portion of the pipeline crossing under federal lands at Lake Oahe. More generally, the U.S. Departments of the Army, Interior, and Justice, along with other federal agencies, held a series of formal government-to-government -government consultations with federally recognized tribes on how federal decision-making on infrastructure projects can better allow for timely and meaningful tribal input. As a result of this consultation, the Department of the Army, the Department of the Interior, and the Department of Justice issued a report in January 2017 titled Improving Tribal Consultation and Tribal Involvement in Federal Infrastructure Decisions. That report is available online and we've brought a copy to share with the Commission today. The United States is aware of allegations of mistreatment of protesters and tensions with law enforcement. We are committed to the right of lawful and peaceful protest activities and affirm the right of persons engaging in such activities to be free from law enforcement misconduct. Moreover, as a founding member of the Voluntary Principles, the United States strongly encourages extractive companies, including Dakota Access LLC, to implement the Voluntary Principles. Doing so would help include um, ensuring that any private security companies hired have policies regarding appropriate conduct and the local use of force that's set out in the Principles. Also of relevance, as I mentioned earlier, the principles provide that private security should act in a lawful manner and exercise restraint and caution in a manner consistent with applicable international guidelines regarding the local use of force, as well as, as, well as with emerging best practices developed by companies, civil society, and governments. All credible allegations of constitutional violations by law enforcement, including uses of excessive force, are being and will continue to be assessed pursuant to federal civil rights law. However, the United States cannot comment on law enforcement investigations or the lack thereof regarding alleged violations of the human rights of protesters.
So we're, we're giving a, a description of sort of the infrastructure of law that, that addresses these kinds of issues. I'm going to talk now about the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, which is a federal government agency, and, and it uh, manages engineering design uh, of construction projects, including some of the ones we've, we, we've been discussing. The core of Civil Works missions is, is water resources, project development, accomplished in collaboration with non-federal partners. The Corps' other key Civil Works mission is to evaluate permit applications for the discharge of dredged or fill material under the Clean Water Act, or the placement of structures or fill into navigable waters under the Rivers and Harbors Act. These are not core projects, but projects of citizens, organizations, or other government agencies. The Corps frequently interacts with American Indian and Alaskan Native governments during the execution of both of these kinds of missions. Like other federal agencies, the Corps takes its federal trust responsibility and the protections of the rights of indigenous people seriously. They've published guidance on proper coordination and consultation with tribes, established an extensive national tribal community of practice, and put tribal liaisons into place in the Corps headquarters, division offices, and also district offices. The Corps has also instituted a successful annual training course called Consulting with Tribal Nations. The Corps' tribal consultation policy strives for an open, timely, meaningful, collaborative, and effective deliberative communication process that emphasizes trust, respect, and shared responsibility. With respect to the permitting process for, Dakota access, for the Dakota Access uh, Pipeline project, the Corps consulted with numerous tribes and received and responded to comments submitted by tribes concerning potential impacts to a variety of resources. The Corps is committed to taking what was learned from the Dakota Access Pipeline experience and input from the tribal leaders provided during these consultation meetings to improve meaningful engagement with tribes in the infrastructure decision-making process. So you can talk about the state legislation. Sure. Thank you. On the topic of recent state-level legislation, let me begin by emphasizing that the United States is a country with strong and long-standing protections for freedom of association, freedom of expression, and the right of peaceful assembly, which are all protected by the United States Constitution. These protections are vital to the work of human rights defenders. The United States supports human rights defenders, as well as the protection of relevant freedoms. These are essential elements of democracy and of our republic. The United States has welcomed the Commission's recent reports on human rights defenders, its report on in integral protection policies for human rights defenders in 2017, and its report on criminalization of human rights defenders in 2016. Um, there's been some discussion today of legislation enacted by states that allegedly targets human rights defenders. I see that I'm running out of time, um, but perhaps in the um, question and answer session um, a bit later, I can go into more detail there. Um, but I'll just close by emphasizing that in the United States, we have a strong tradition of protecting and defending the rights of individuals to speak out and express themselves. The United States is proud to stand up for those who seek to be heard and to associate with others to defend human rights. Thank you again, commissioners, for this dialogue on a critically important issue. Muchísimas gracias. Vamos a darle ahora eh, la oportunidad a los colegas de la comisión y voy a darle la palabra en primer lugar a la relatora de país, la comisionada Margaret May McCauley. Yes. Um, thank you. I seem to have an allergic um, situation going with my eyes this morning. Um, good morning. Yes. I, I wish to thank you um, first for your presentation. I know the time is short, and um, but you are very clear and articulate. And, and as you mentioned, this is a city, the North Dakota access um, pipeline is a situation which has been in world news attention and so on um, but it's good to hear directly from the people's actually affected by it and I thank the state for your clear and um, cogent response um, to the matter. If I may um, just ask um, a couple of questions of the state um, 
we are aware of the constitutional legal uh, protection of freedom of association and rights of assembly, freedom of speech, um, which exists in the states. But like all states, um, we have the laws, but persons, agents of the state and so on, of course, sometimes ignore those laws and thereby violates the rights of, of peoples. This happens everywhere. And um, so this is one of the reasons why one could not understand the excesses which happened um, during the North Dakota pipeline, ac um, access pipeline um, protests, which the, the tribes were undertaking. Um, because they were exercising their right of assembly, right to protest, right to speech, in opposition to whatever was going on. And the U.S. has a long history of, of that kind of um, conduct. So could you explain exactly what happened? Because I, I still really don't understand why these excesses happened. Well, I understand about the private security um, but that still doesn't really answer because the core is supposed to be sort of like monitoring what happened, what, what goes on in that sort of, of um, activity, from what I understand. But I may be wrong if you could explain, explain it for us. Um, and then also another point which I, I don't know, I do, I'm not sure if I understood you right. A right. Yeah. I'm not sure if I understood you correctly um, when you spoke about the federal civil civil rights law, which um, applies. Um, um, and I wonder, does that mean then that individual officers or, or agents who are working for the company or for state agencies like the sheriff's office and what have you? cannot be criminally charged for their um, violent excesses? I'm, I'm asking Esmeralda <laughs> them to answer. Um, or is it only civil action which can be taken, for instance, claims for damages and what have you? Um, um, I, I, I wanted to be clear in the, in the legal, not yet, not yet, because you'll have to hear from all of us first. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, there was another note that I made, because I didn't want to delay too long, because this is too important a matter for all of us to um, have a, a go. Um, Yes, I, 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 there, there are a lot of things you mentioned uh, in, which seem to have been put in place in order for this not to happen. And, and in, yet the nations recognize as being a specific autonomous nations who have their own governments and, and courts even. And yet <laughs> there is a disconnect seems to be, and I, I really cannot put my, my hand on it. And um, why, is there, a, is there a question as to the entitlement to their sacred <laughs> lands and tribal lands? Is, is, is that it? Because if, if it is recognized by the federal state that they, this is, these areas are their lands and, and these lands are sacred to them because of the graves of their departed um, ancestors and so on, why is there, it seems, an invasion without prior consultation and consent? I didn't hear consent. You said the court consult, consulted a great deal with, with, with a number of tribes, but I didn't hear consent. Um, so, or is this not part of US uh, um, law? Yes. Uh, and practice. Um, I think I'll end, end it there. Um, and if I recall the other point, I would have asked for time. Thank you. Gracias, Commissioner Margaret. Eh, Commissioner eh, Antonia. 
Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much for being here today, and thank you very much for the state also for, for bringing all this information. Um, I have a few um, questions. Um, one is post Standing Rock. Um, you mentioned that when this situation happened, more than 142 people were detained. I would like to know if those people afterwards were prosecuted. Were they, you know, did you have any more information about that, if possible? Um, and if so, um, what were the felonies you were accused of? I mean, the felonies on the lead, no? Yes. Yeah. We understand. Um, also, um, I would like to ask the state if, um, because I, I, rem I remember that event, and I, I know this is not like the state said, we're not discussing Standing Rock, but it is, it is an example of a, a situation that the, the civil society here has brought to us today. And in that sense, um, I think not only um, in the US, but in the world, everybody was quite impressed of the disproportionate use of force of the police on that occasion. I don't know whether there were any investigations regarding the injured that were, that were people that were injured there, was there any investigations of what of the disproportionate use of force at the time? Um, then I would like to ask, you mentioned five, you, you said there were five political prisoners today in the US, indigenous people. I would have, to, I would like to have more information about what they, are, they have been accused of or um, what are the felonies they have committed and the situation. Maybe you don't have time to give us that information today and you could send it afterwards, but I think it would be very important to have that information for the Commission. Um, um, also, sorry, and it's related to my previous question, um, and, and you mentioned it at the beginning, um, are there any training to the, um, is the state doing training for public agents that relate to indigenous people? Not only the, the public officials and um, police, but public agents of how they have to um, go into the territories and relate to indigenous people? Is, is my question clear? Maybe I should talk in Spanish, but is it clear? Um, and then I, I'm just going to talk in Spanish now. Um, I just want to make a statement. Um, yo, yo solo quiero recordar que la, la, la Comisión Interamericana de Derechos Humanos tiene, tiene básicamente dos dos funciones, una cierto es conocer el sistema de peticiones y casos, pero también nosotros tenemos una función de monitoreo y cuando hacemos monitoreo de la situación de los países, eh, ese monitoreo lo hacemos a la luz de los estándares interamericanos en materia de derechos humanos y esos estándares hoy en día, sobre todo en situación de pueblos indígenas, hay ciertos estándares que son principios generales que se entienden que están dentro de la evolución del derecho internacional de los derechos humanos y que van más allá de los tratados específicos o declaraciones específicas que los países han suscrito. Eh, y en ese sentido me parece eh, necesario reafirmar que la Comisión Interamericana tiene competencia sobre la Declaración Americana de Derechos de los Pueblos Indígenas y me parece importante reafirmarlo eh, y lo digo por, porque por una declaración que hizo el Estado a propósito de la competencia de la Comisión y necesito, no es una pregunta, es una afirmación la que simplemente quiero hacer eh, y, y efectivamente Estados Unidos como miembro de la organización cierto eh, está sujeto a las obligaciones de la Carta y la Declaración Americana y en eso no, hay, no, no, hay, no, hay discu no tenemos discusión pero las obligaciones que establece la Declaración Americana cierto eh, están dentro de lo que es la, la evolución del derecho internacional de los derechos humanos así lo interpreta la, la Comisión y quisiera eh, simplemente señalar eso muchas gracias gracias comisionada Antonia comisionado Francisco Gracias, Presidenta. Recuerdo que la Comisión en una o dos ocasiones, en años pasados, tuvo oportunidad de conocer de alguno de estos sucesos. Yo lo recuerdo bien porque participé en esas reuniones, además en ese tiempo yo era responsable para el tema de los derechos de los pueblos indígenas. Actualmente estoy en el tema de defensores de derechos humanos. Y creo que hay algunos aspectos que están claros. Es decir, el Estado reconoce que se produjeron excesos de violencia en esa situación. Eh, la historia de los hechos más o menos también ya la conocemos. Eh, por eso, complementando algo de lo que había dicho mi 
colega Antonia, yo quería preguntar un poco cómo estamos hoy. Eh, es decir, eh, en, aquella, en alguna de estas reuniones que tuvimos, no recuerdo si fue en Panamá o en Washington, eh, hubo una amplia delegación de los Estados Unidos, estaban presentes también algunas autoridades eh, federales, eh, ingenieros militares, y recuerdo que se planteó del lado de alguna de estas autoridades que había un reconocimiento de que no había habido una consulta y un consentimiento y que esto era necesario, y que uno de los grandes temas en debate era por el paso de este ducto por algunas tierras o recursos de los pueblos indígenas. Y que esa era un poco la discusión, el, el no haber consentido y la posibilidad de que se cambiara esa ruta para que no tocara sitios que se consideraban para los pueblos indígenas afectados, lugares sagrados, centros de oración que estaban viéndose afectados o el riesgo de contaminación por algún accidente del agua. Más o menos era así, ¿no? Por lo que yo recuerdo, han pasado como dos años. Entonces, a mí me gusta, y, y no, dijeron estas autoridades que había una disposición a buscar, a estudiar. Entonces, yo quisiera saber simplemente eh, qué pasó después. Eh, es decir, qué pasó, el proyecto simplemente se ejecutó tal cual, eh, cómo está la posibilidad, más allá de lo que fueron aquellos sucesos de aquellos días, eh, hoy en día los pueblos indígenas afectados pueden realizar con normalidad su actividad religiosa en esos lugares, sus recursos, sus tierras, ¿se han visto perturbadas por estos sucesos? Gracias. Y claro, ¿qué pasó con los juzgamientos que se han informado, no? Es decir, la parte penal. Margaret tiene una, una pregunta. Un... Algo que se le vino ya, al, recordó, recordó. Yes, I, I sí. remember the other point I wanted to ask the state. And this was whether any of the persons who were um, arrested, um, detained in inhumane um, um, conditions, um, abused and numbered, as we saw, um, were offered compensation by the state. Edison, relator de, para la libertad de expresión. Uh, good morning, everyone. I want to thank all the presentation by the, the civil society and, and the state. It's very useful for us, this, uh, you know, interchange. Um, I'm following in Spanish for my, my question. Um, uh, quiero centralizarme en el asunto de, de la criminalización, de las leyes que criminalizan... Uh, sorry que quiero un poco centralizar mi, mi pregunta en, en cuanto a las leyes que ustedes mencionaron, los proyectos de ley que ustedes mencionaron, que se presentaron después de estos episodios para eh, criminalizar formas de protesta, o, entiendo que a título, por ejemplo, de sabotaje o subversión, en fin, es, serían los, los conceptos que se han presentado. Entiendo y me parece bien interesante esta esta reunión para entender cómo funciona obviamente el sistema de controles dentro de Estados Unidos, cuáles serían, digamos, la situación en que está cada una de esas iniciativas. Sabemos que muchas veces hay legisladores que a título individual tienen obviamente la facultad de presentar proyectos de ley. Nosotros lo hemos eh, señalado en nuestros informes anuales como una preocupación, este, esta multitud de, de proyectos, pero sería bien interesante saber en qué estado están, si hay alguno que, que fue aprobado y digamos que eh, digamos que, que acciones de contralor de constitucionalidad internos existen ¿no? y también a la luz de lo que mencionaban mis colegas las comisionadas de, de a la luz de digamos de, de si estas leyes son aprobadas como eh, si están alineadas o no obviamente con la primera enmienda pero con la declaración americana en lo que nos importa a nosotros y el departamento de estado o esta agencia o este Working Group eh, Interagencia también se encarga de ver estas legislaciones. Y lo digo porque, además obviamente de los controles internos y que reconocemos que en este Estados Unidos es un Estado de Derecho que funciona en ese sentido, eh, pero de prosperar este tipo de normas también van a tener un impacto en la región, porque 
justamente por ser Estados Unidos un país que protege en forma reforzada los derechos de libertad de expresión, de asociación y protesta, cualquier digamos este cambio o cuestión que implique una vulneración de estos derechos, eventualmente también va a ser imitado por otros estados de la región, porque este es un tema que está presente en todos los estados de la región. Entonces nos importa, por obviamente, que Estados Unidos es parte de la eh, declaración americana y de la competencia de la Comisión, pero también por, por el impacto regional que esto tiene. Muchas gracias. Gracias. Bueno, eh, tengo ventajas y desventajas de ser eh, la que conduce la audiencia, porque... Mis colegas me, ya me han adelantado algunos puntos. Yo quisiera solo precisar eh, algo que la sociedad civil marcó, la representación, eh, el cumplimiento real, efectivo, del de derecho a la consulta previa e informada, que... Eh, se, se indica que esto no, no se da en los términos que se, se requieren para realmente escuchar la posición de los eh, afectados en una determinada eh, situación y particularmente eh, a, con, a, los pueblos, a los pueblos indígenas. Eh, yo quiero también reconocer que el, el, el Estado ha hecho una, eh, eh, un reconocimiento igual de lo que representan estos motivos de tensión actualmente en, en el Estado. Se han reconocido estos sucesos que, que se dieron. Eh, hay acciones como las mesas de trabajo que están dirigidas a buscar precisamente el desarrollo de buenas prácticas, muy particularmente en materia de defensores de los derechos humanos. Me gustaría saber qué, qué, qué tanto avance hay en esas, el resultado de esas, de esas mesas de trabajo en búsqueda de unas propuestas de actuaciones dirigidas a garantizar la protección de las personas defensoras de derechos humanos ¿no? y con eh, las características diferenciadas en materia de mujeres defensoras de derechos humanos, mujeres indígenas defensoras de derechos humanos y que eh, nos gustaría pues también tener una precisión de esos eh, aspectos. Eh, Comparto la, las posiciones de, de mis colegas en materia de lo que representa para la, para la comisión su mandato y la posibilidad eh, de, esta, de esta audiencia. Y, y bueno, la presencia del Estado nos da también esa, esa fortaleza en el ejercicio, en el cumplimiento de nuestro mandato. Yo concluyo para darle la palabra les voy a dar, eh, bueno, ya se nos ha pasado el tiempo, pero les voy a dar seis minutos para cada uno. Eh, sabemos que no es, no es posible, bueno, tiene que ser, porque si no nos tomamos nosotros cinco más. Eh, el, la, la, la posibilidad de, no se va a poder contestar todo, eh, de, de remitir la información, toda la información que se tiene para complementarla. A la sociedad civil, la palabra. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, as to the question on the cases, out of the 836 state criminal court cases, 392 were dismissed, 42 were acquitted, 188 accepted diversion. Um, out of all of these cases, only 26 were convicted out of the 836. 42 remain on inactive state uh, status. Many of the criminal cases shouldn't have been brought due to lack of probable cause. And also in, in reference to the um, 
Army Corps consultation. The Army Corps did not consult with the Yankton Sioux. That is evidenced in the request for precautionary measures that the Standing Rock submitted in September in Exhibit 3. Yankton did not get consultation by the Corps, nor did any of these tribes give consent. Since the um, uh, easement has been granted. There has been dozens of spills of the Dakota Access Pipeline. There has been no compensation to the victims. The recommendation that was given by the Special Rapporteur to the state party to investigate um, the excessive force through the DOI has not been um, has not been acted on, despite the UN Rapporteur giving the state party this um, um, uh, question. Um, in terms of the private security and the voluntary principles you mentioned, they are voluntary principles. Um, they, uh, the, the individual, the uh, private security actor Tiger Swan has continued to act unethically um, at the tail end of DAPL in Louisiana, not receiving licenses there either. Um, in terms of the bills that you've mentioned, um, one of the worst bills that we have is occurring in uh, South Dakota, a riot boosting act, which creates a fund specific specifically dedicated to going after individuals and organizations that they believe are involved in riot boosting. So this means that anyone, um, if I like a Facebook post of an individual human rights defender, I could be subject to this riot boosting act and then charged criminally um, under South Dakota's riot boosting act. And again, this is a direct response from the Dakota Access Pipeline in anticipation of TransCanada's um, uh, KXL pipeline, another pipeline, which is not consented to by the tribes impacted. Um, there is no free prior informed consent as a matter of law in the United States of America. Um, what we have right now is an ineffective system where tribes are given mere notice and they are not given uh, consent as was evidenced in the emblematic case of Standing Rock, North Dakota. And I will leave the rest of the time to Leola uh, Cowboy to discuss the federal defendants. Thank you. So in relation to what Casey had said, the 142 cases or arrests, excuse me, on October 27, 2016, those five political prisoners that I did mention, including my husband, were out of those that arrest state. The charges were use of fire to commit a federal offense and civil disorder. Those charges totaled 15 years in prison, and I'm talking federal prison. These are federal indictments. These are not state level. So when we're talking about the criminalization of indigenous people, those are the, ser the most serious charges that came out of the No Dapple movement. And I just want to say that these people today are sitting in prison and it is a horrific time. My husband is sitting in USP Hazleton right now and he's been there for 10 months and he's been he's experienced 14 lockdowns. These lockdowns have lo have lasted 2 to 2 2 weeks to 2 months. I don't get to talk to him in that time and we don't know if he's alive or dead. There's been three murders last year alone. This is for him standing up for his homelands and protecting the water. Thank you. If I may, as a, an elected official of a sovereign nation of the Ponca Nation of Oklahoma, I can tell you that consultation does not work. Consent does work. Free prior and informed consent. Uh, Keystone pipeline came through our territory as a result of those pipelines work TransCanada meeting with two individual Ponca members who said, yeah, great, give us a playground and we'll let the pipelines go through. That was their consultation. So consultation does not work. As for the injuries that were suffered during those arrests and during those times, I was there as, a, as an observer and given permission to stand there prior to being arrested and put in cages. And I still suffer from injuries to my neck that causes me not to be able to lift my arms. The other elders who were there that were already injured. We have children who were thrown from their horses that were being run down by ATVs. We all suffer from PTSD. We all suffer from uh, cardiovascular problems caused by the spraying of chemicals in that territory too. So reparations are something that we could certainly uh, understand or do just for medical help. Thank you. 
Muchas gracias. Vamos a darle la palabra al Estado. So I will, I will just briefly give an umbrella comment, and luckily my colleague is a lawyer and has familiarity with the details of some of these issues. I just want to reaffirm what we said at the outset, which is that we know these are real issues and real concerns. The reason for our presence here is because we understand there are real issues and real concerns. We are not dismissing them. What we are saying is that our system uh, functions to address them. Does it function perfectly? We are a constitutional republic, a nation of laws. Does it function perfectly? No, it does not. But it does have a self-correcting facet that I think makes it one of the greatest democracies uh, in the world. And again, I don't want to get into a, a, a theological debate about whether we accept the, the jurisdiction of the commission or not. But our presence here is meant to honor your work and to underscore our acknowledgement of its value. But I need to say what I said because I can't be misinterpreted to, 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 to have the, our physical presence here acknowledge the competency or the jurisdiction of the commissions. I, I, can't, I can't do that as, as, a, as a US diplomat. So, I'll end there and allow my colleague who has a very a, a sort of more granular understanding of the issues to answer some of the detailed questions. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Alexis, and thank you for the opportunity to address your questions, commissioners. I'll do my best to, um, to get to um, as many of the questions raised as possible. Um, I'll, I'll begin uh, with the issue raised by the Special Rapporteur um, about recent state-level legislation that's, that's been passed in this area. Um, as was mentioned, I think earlier, North Dakota enacted legislation in April of this year that increased penalties for individuals who tamper with construction and operation of pipelines and other what's called critical infrastructure. And similar legislation has been introduced in a number of other states and it has been enacted in several of them. The legislation varies uh, but tends to increase penalties for trespassing on or tampering with various kinds of facilities including pipelines or other infrastructure. Now, of course, this legislation does not criminalize activities protected by the First Amendment, the U.S. Constitution, and because trespassing on and tampering with pipelines and other infrastructure is not conduct protected by the Constitution, nor is it conduct contemplated by the rights expressed in the American Declaration. Um, it should also be noted that opponents to these laws can challenge them in court, on their face, or in any subsequent prosecution and our independent judiciary will determine whether or not the laws are unconstitutional or otherwise invalid. Um, also mentioned um, was recent legislation enacted in South Dakota criminalizing um, what's called right boosting. Um, right boosting includes encouraging or directing someone to engage in a riot, which is defined as the use of force or violence by three or more people acting together. The law enables state and local governments to seek compensation from individuals who engage in right boosting and increases penalties for such conduct. The legislation is currently subject to litigation in federal district court in the state of South Dakota, and we await the outcome of that litigation. Um, but, but sort of more broadly, the United States has consistently promoted consultation and dialogue to engage on these difficult issues and has encouraged private companies to adhere to the standards set out in the voluntary principles. Uh, on, on the question of, of consultations, without speaking on the consultations um, in any particular um, issue, um, in part because some of those are still subject to active litigation, um, the most tangible um, result I think I can provide to the Commission today about um, progress that, that the government has made um, in terms of consultation in this specific context um, is the 2017 report, which um, I obviously won't try to summarize in any detail here, um, but, but I will be happy to leave with the Commission um, to review um, after the hearing. Um, in terms of the activities of the working group, I, I can confirm that the protection of women who um, support engage in human rights defense, as well as um, the rights of indigenous human rights defenders are topics that the working group actively engages in. Um, and and uh, seeing that I'm, I'm running out of time, I'll just thank you again, um, the Commission, um, for holding this hearing, for inviting us here today, and engaging in this important work. Thank you. Muchísimas gracias. Eh, vamos a dar por terminada eh, la audiencia, solicitándoles nuevamente, por favor, nos hagan llegar todos 
los, la información que fuera eh, posible. Muchas gracias y damos por terminada la audiencia.